Okay. Lecture 15. Wow. It, it doesn't feel like we've had that many, but we're rocking and rolling in here. So, all right, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, just a couple of announcements. So, did everybody get your grade report via email? Did everybody get that? Okay, so the way that I do the exam grades is you get one of those, which goes through all of the deductions that you got on the exam and why you got them. Uh, drop that. Um, so uh, that way, you know, if you got, a, I don't know, an 86 on the exam, that means you got 14 points taken off, and that report will detail how those uh, deductions were made and why. Um, I'm curious, did, uh, did anybody uh, watch the video that I posted on Teams? Did anybody watch that or at least was able to access it? Okay, good. So uh, what I did is I posted a video on Teams which goes through the exam in a little bit more detail where it goes through um, the statistics on the exam, like how the class did as a whole, um, and some advice for future exams. Um, I used to do that in class, uh, but one of the things I started doing last year during the pandemic is I would record that as a video off to the side. And I, I kind of think that's a good idea to make sure that we're not eating up class time in here, you know, regurgitating the exam. So I really would watch it because it's only like 10 minutes and there's some tips and tricks I, I, I mentioned at the end of the video for future exams that you ought to look into. Um, in terms of the last thing I'll say about the exams, um, this is a picture I took of the, uh, the dean suite, and I have a little table here. Uh, like as you walk in, there's these two chairs to the, uh, uh, to the left, and on the table are the exams for this class, the, the scratch computations that you did. I didn't mark these up, so there's nothing on them, just your work. If you'd like them, you're more than welcome to come and get them. Uh, I was gonna, you know, I thought, do I hand them out in here? If I hand them out in here, I mean, there's 60 people. I'd be in here all day doing that. So um, I just, I'm gonna leave them out there for the week. So uh, get them by Friday if you want, and I'll probably get rid of them after that. Uh, but they're uh, available to get, you know, at your leisure. Sound good? Okay, and, and again, I, I think I, I mentioned this in the video, I do think the class did very well on the exam uh, overall. I think the averages were, were very nice. Okay, so uh, today, uh, homework 3.2 was due today, and I'm assigning homework 3.3, and we're rocking and rolling uh, in the world of moments. So let's go back and recall a couple of things, and I want to talk a little bit about the cross product just to make sure that we're all clear on something. So the cross product is one of the two ways that we can multiply vectors. And I want to talk a little bit about that direction. So if you have two vectors, those two vectors form a plane, right? And A cross B is the vector normal to that plane. And that's going to be kind of important when we talk about vectors or moments in two dimensions today. Because that's, that's what our goal today is to go back to the second dimension. Um, or in 2D, I guess. Um, as for the, the grunt work in computing the cross product, I'm not really going to get too much into that because I think at this point that should be pretty familiar. Now, the whoop, sorry, the, the definition of a moment uh, is defined as R cross F. So R is that position vector. It starts at the point about which moments are taking, taken. So if you're taking moments about this point right here, this is where the vector starts. And the vector points to any point that's on the line of action of the force in question. So if here's the point, here's the force, then R can point from here to here, here to here, here to here, anywhere along that line of action, and you will generate the same moment. Um, I did have a, a student uh, email me over the weekend, and they asked me uh, about the, um, the, uh, the last homework, that they were doing two different position vectors, and they got different answers. And the actual, the difference was not the theory or the idea, it was just rounding. So. Just, just know that, that you know, your calculations can be sensitive and stuff like that, but theoretically the, the same answer worked out. Now, one of the things I do want to emphasize also is that remember, really what we're talking about when we uh, talk about the magnitude of the moment is the magnitude of the force multiplied by this moment arm. And the moment arm is the shortest distance from the point in question to the line of action, usually that perpendicular distance. And so that'll become a little bit clear today. Uh, Everybody good so far? Okay, so let's talk about uh, 3D to 2D. Here, here's the deal, okay? The, the facts are that um, more often than not, engineers prefer to operate in 2D as opposed to 3D. And when, they, when possible, they will idealize three-dimensional systems 
as 2D uh, in order to simplify the analysis and design. 2D is a lot easier to convey to uh, uh, you know, your fellow engineers or clients or, or what have you. you know, if I have a three-dimensional bridge, I'm a bridge engineer, I can't help using a bridge as an example. But if I have this three-dimensional bridge, what I'll do is I might idealize this truss as a two-dimensional system. Is there con some conservatism built in that idealization? Yes. Um, but with that conservatism breeds simplicity, uh, and it makes the uh, analysis uh, and resulting design, which is what engineers are here to do, uh, all the more simpler. So more often than not, engineers will um, try and uh, idealize three-dimensional problems in 2D uh, to make things a, a little easier. I mean, e do, you know, even just keeping it basic. I mean, we do our calculations on paper. It's in, it's in paper, you know, that, those uh, schematics are usually in two dimensions. So if we can do that, uh, it, it will make our life a little easier. Uh, a lot of times when we, uh, even when we talk about 3D in here, and, and let's be clear, uh, just because engineers um, uh, like to simplify things uh, in two dimensions doesn't mean that we always can. We do need to have the tools uh, necessary to assess three-dimensional problems when we can. That's why we talk about them in here. But a lot of times we use three-dimensional uh, topics like in a course like statics just to reinforce what we do in 2D because later on when we start looking at applications and we start looking at computing centroids and actual structural analysis like solving trusses and shear and moment diagrams, that's all going to be 2D problems. Okay. So more often than not we try and keep things in 2D and we use 3D just as a means of explaining uh, also what's going on in 2D sometimes. So let's, let's talk about moments in 2D. So remember, the moment expression is defined as R cross S, okay? So R could be some arbitrary vector, Rxi plus Ryj plus Rzk, and then the force vector could be some, you know, Fxi plus Fyj plus Fzk. Well, if I'm dealing exclusively in the second dimension in 2D, I know that I don't have any Z components. So let's say that this was my expression R cross F, okay? So this is my R vector and this is my F vector and there's no third dimension terms, no terms about the Z axis. So I say, okay, let's take this and let's evaluate the cross product assuming that there's no Z terms, okay? So here's the R vector. So let's look at how this is set up. So this is uh, M naught is R cross F. So the first row is I, J, K. The second row is my position vector coefficients, and the third row is my force vector coefficients. And notice I've got zero terms right here, okay? Now, what I've done here is I've said, okay, let's take this and let's use cofactor expansion. I, I'm usually a fan of that because I think it's easier to collate the analysis at the end of the day. So I've got a pile of junk times I minus a pile of junk times K plus a pile, or sorry, a pile of junk times I minus a pile of junk times J plus a pile of junk times K. Let's look at the I terms. I've got I multiplied by this determinant. Now, how do you do a two by two determinant? You do this times this minus this times this. What's that going to be? Zero. Zero. What about this one right here? This times this minus this times this. Zero. Zero. But this one's actually going to have a value, right? So when you split this up and you actually look at it, you know, from a, from a two D perspective, the, the the facts are that a lot of these terms uh, simplify. In fact, when you do the cross product of R cross F in 2D, you're only left with one term. Now what's weird, uh, at least maybe initially, is hold on. I've got a vector in 2D and a vector in 2D, but when I do the cross product, I'm left with a K term. Does that make sense? Well, let's think about that, okay? Would you agree that this screen represents the second dimension? Right, this is a 2D screen, right? So if I have vector A, right, and let's say vector B, right, so this is B, this is A, okay, and we do A cross B, okay, so how do we define A cross B? It has a magnitude and a direction. What is the magnitude of A cross B? The magnitude of A cross B is the area of that parallelogram, right? But what about the direction? The direction is normal to the plane formed by A and B, right? So what is normal to this plane? It's out of the screen, right? It's pointing towards you, right? So if this is 
the y-axis, and this is the x-axis. This screen is the plane formed by those two vectors, so the cross product is going to point this way, right? Make sense? So any time that you're dealing with a two-dimensional problem, the moments are going to sort of point in the third direction, in the third dimension. But remember, what was the whole point of moments? Like, what, what were we defining the moment for? We were defining the moment to, to try and solve the problem of not translation, but rotation, right? Okay? So, remember, the idea is that if I have some, let me erase all this so that I can kind of explain what's going on here. If I have some point O right here and some force, right, that force is going to want to rotate that point O, right? Well, that axis of rotation is out of the screen. It either points this way or this way, either positive Z or negative Z. So the, the point is whenever we're dealing with moments uh, in 2D, the moment expression is always along the z-axis. So usually when we're dealing in 2D, we dispense with the vector notation. We say it's a polyjunct times k, but really all we care about is the magnitude. So a formula that you can use to determine a moment in two dimensions is this formula right here, rx fy minus ry fx. Okay? And that's the formula, but I, I really, really like the example that we're going to do today because this example, I think, really, really hammers home the concept of moments. If there's any one example or any one lecture that I think really nails it, I think it's this one in this particular example. So I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have a lever here, and so I've got point O and point A. The lever is 24 inches long and there's a 100 pound load applied at point A acting vertically, okay? So what I wanna know is I wanna know the moment about point O, okay? And we're actually gonna do that two different ways, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask, okay, what, would the, what horizontal force at A would generate the same moment? And then what is the smallest force that would generate the same moment? Uh, and I think if you really want to understand what's going on, this is, this is where it's at, okay? So let me pull up the notebook. Again, I've got all this copy and pasted on the notebook, so you're not going to miss anything. And we'll get into it. No, I don't care about that. <clears throat> okay. I'll give everybody a sec to copy this down, and then we'll get into it. Okay. See, I see folks are still writing down, so we'll give you a minute. As you're writing this down, I want somebody to help me out. Can somebody define this force vector in IJ notation by just looking at it? Like, what's the deal with this 100 pound force? If you had to write that in vector notation, how would you write it? I'm talking about this 100 pound load right here. How would you write that in vector notation? There you go. And we'll say, expressed in pounds, just so that that's clear. Everybody good on that? Okay. Now, in order to do a moment, we need a position vector. Okay, and so I propose that my position vector, let's remember, 
the position vector can point anywhere from O, since we're determining the moment about point O, to anywhere along that line of action of that force. So remember this little dotted line I've drawn, that is the line of action. Let's do this. I have a triangle here. I can do better than that. Okay, and this is 24 inches, and this is 60 degrees. And so this is going to be the Y component, this is going to be the X component. Would you agree? that Rx is going to be 24 inches times the cosine of 60 degrees and Ry is 24 inches times the sine of 60 degrees. Would that be a fair assessment? Could be okay. So let's see. 24 times the cosine of 60 I know that the cosine of 60 is a half, so that's 12 inches. I might need some help on this one. Somebody help me out. What's this one? We'll say, I don't know, two decimal places, although we can track the decimal places in our, our, our calculators. So, 20.78. Do I have a second on that? So, would you agree then? that R is, now help me out with the signs. Are they both positive? Are they negative? What's the deal? This is 12. Are they positive, negative? What's the deal? Somebody help me out. Positive. There you go. So, I'm going to stop for a sec and let everybody catch up, and I want to see if anybody has any questions. I don't want to rush through this, okay? We've got plenty of time. So far, so good? Okay, so I've got an R vector. I've got an F vector. Now, to be clear, you could use your cross product, you know, your determinant, your cofactor expansion, rule of Ceres, just use zeros for the uh, uh, <coughs> for the z terms and just do it that way but I'm gonna be lazy and use this um, this new term here let me move this down because I'm gonna use this image here in a sec so moment computation okay now moment computation so R is 12i plus 20.78j and f is 0i minus 100j so actually let me let me just be consistent so this is in inches and this is in pounds so therefore, our moment is going to be, and we'll, uh, actually let me, let me put moment sub naught, is going to be, and this is our new formula now, Rx Fy minus Ry Fx, right? And that's just doing that uh, cross product uh, symbolically and only taking the terms that matter. So. Rx, Fy, and, and look, if you set it up like this, all we're doing is saying this times this minus this times this. That's all we're doing. So, <coughs> so,
What's this going to be? I think you can probably just look at this. Not 1,200, but negative 1,200, right? You're, or did you say negative 1,200? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, okay, negative 1,200, all right? What are the units? Inches times pounds, right? So akin to a torque, we'll say inch pounds. Now, before we move on, first off, that's the answer, okay? But before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about direction, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about the right-hand rule so that you can kind of equate the right-hand rule to what's going on in this problem. Now, what the right-hand rule states is that if you have a cross product, so let me, um, let me do this off to the side here. Okay, so the right-hand rule states that if you have a vector here and a, uh, a vector here, that vector A cross B points like this. And so I know that's kind of tough from a screen perspective, but the idea from the right-hand rule is this. So you take your right hand, and you take your fingers and you point them towards the first vector and you curl them towards the second vector. And the idea is that if you point your uh, fingers towards the first vector, curl them towards the second, whichever way your thumb is pointing is the direction of the positive cross product. So A cross B, the positive cross product sort of points like that. So what that means is that in two dimensions, counterclockwise moments are positive. Now, how do I get that? Here's the x-axis. Here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis, right? If this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. Z-axis points like that, right? So positive x, positive y, positive z. My fingers are rotating counterclockwise. With me so far? So what I'm getting at is if, if uh, counterclockwise moments are positive, then this answer means that M naught is 1,200 inch pounds <coughs> clockwise. That's what the negative means. The negative means that this is a clockwise moment. Now, I'm going to convince you of that another way. Okay. Another, <coughs> excuse me. Another way of looking at whether or not this is a clockwise moment is to just look at the problem. Here's the problem. Oh, sorry. Sorry, hold on. Sorry. Here's the problem. Here's point O. Here's 100 pounds. Which way is that going to turn point O? Clockwise, right? And so when we do the math, according to the theory, the math gives us a negative moment, and negative moments are clockwise. So there you go. With me so far? This isn't too bad, right? Okay. Now, let me give you another way of looking at this. Okay? Here's another way of looking at this problem. A simpler way of looking at this problem. Because I'm all about making things simple if I can. Let's look at the... <coughs> alternate definition of a moment. Okay?
First off, we need a force. The force is just the magnitude of that force vector, which in this case is 100 pounds. The next thing that we need is a moment arm. Now, the moment arm is defined as the shortest distance from point naught, point O, to the line of action of F. Okay? So, going back to my little cheat sheet image here, here's point naught, this That's the line of action, and so I propose that this dimension right here is D. That's the moment arm. The distance from point naught to the, the shortest distance from point naught to the line of action. And what is that for this problem? Rx, Rx which is 12 inches. So. So therefore, I propose that this moment is just force times distance, which is 100 pounds times 12 inches, which by golly gosh gee, 100 times 12 is 1,200. And just use the context of the problem to know here's point naught, there's the force, it's spinning it that way, so we say that that moment is clockwise. Another way of looking at it. So like with forces, forces we were interested in their direction, right? Forces, I got a 20 pound force pointing up or a 25 pound force pointing to the right. With moments, it's about, I've got a 600 foot pound moment rotating counterclockwise, or a 720 foot pound moment rotating clockwise, etc. So, just like with forces, moments, we want another magnitude and their direction. Now we're not done, we've got a couple other things we want to compute about this. But, before I stop and or before I go on to the next uh, uh, question in this problem, does anybody have any questions on this? <clears throat> okay. Let's explore some things. I can do better than that. Come on. Which, by the way, if you need me to scroll back up or anything, let me know. Now. There were a couple of questions asked on this problem. Let's look at the first one. What horizontal force applied at A would Hold on, I, I can be a little neater than that, would generate the same moment. I used to have somewhat pretty handwriting, and then, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay, so what horizontal force at A, or gener or applied at A would generate the same moment? So let's see if we can figure that out, okay? So here's my atrocious attempt at drawing this bar, okay? So here's point O, here's point A, and I'm looking for some force some force here, okay, that would generate 
a 1,200 inch pound moment. So, let's see if we can apply this whole this whole definition. Moment equals force times distance. I think that's going to be a lot easier than breaking out that RxFy minus RyFx hullabaloo. So, what do we know? Well, M0 is 1,200 inch-pounds. The force, I don't know. But what about D? Well, remember, what is D? This is the line of action. And what we're trying to find is the shortest distance from that line of action to point naught. So if point naught, if it has a parallel line that's something like this, what we're interested in is that. And what is D in this problem? Or Y. And R Y is what? Was it 20.78? So, what's P going to be in this instance? We'll say like round to one decimal place, keep it simple. <clears throat> Fifty seven point seven five. So we'll say fifty seven point seven. Do I have a second on that? All right. Fifty seven point seven what? Pounds. Now Does that make sense? Now, here's the kicker. This is sort of my favorite part of the problem. First of all, hey, do, I, do I need to lay, stay here for a little bit? Okay. Here's my favorite part. What is the smallest? force What is the smallest force that you could apply at A to generate the same moment? Okay. Let's think about that. So, again, another atrocious example of this bar. Okay. And this is point O, this is point A, and we're trying to generate a a 1,200 inch pound moment. Hmm. Let's think about that. Maybe the the oh goodness, maybe the um, the the better way of of looking at this question is to maybe ask it a little differently. Let me ask you this way. What direction should I apply the load at A to be most effective? Perpendicular to the lever. That's exactly right. It goes back to that example that I had of the, 
mechanic trying to apply the torque. If I want to put as much oomph on this uh, bar as possible, I want that force to go like that. We'll call it Q. And so I need to figure out what is the magnitude of Q. Maybe I'll, I'll take the error off so I can say I want the magnitude. Does that make sense? So if that's the case, let's go back. Moment equals force times distance. 1,200 inch-pounds equals Q times a moment arm. Hmm. That moment arm. What's the deal with that? Well, would you agree this is the line of action of that force? What is the shortest distance from the line of action 2.0? The length of the lever, which is 24 inches. So this, and I'll call this R. Q is just 50 pounds. Let me stop for a sec and see if you have any questions. Does this make sense? This is probably one of the more seminal lectures in understanding moments, okay? This is, this is important stuff. Yes, sir? If you have a question like this on the moment, do we also have to specify the final angle of the force that's on orientation? That's a good question. Um, I, I, so the question was, uh, if we have a question like this on the exam, do we have to specify the orientation? Um, what I would say is I think it would depend on the problem in general. And um, for the specific problem that you're, you're going to be having uh, for homework 3.3, um, it is. so what I'll say is you're given a system and asked a series of questions like this. And I think the answers that it's looking for are pretty clear that you're not having to, oh, by the way, I need to invent what's going on with this, uh, with this uh, uh, scenario here. So I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. But one of the, the simplest ways that you can um, determine that is, you know, if you have your Rx and Ry terms, you can swap them and then divide by the length, right? Because how do you determine the uh, slope of a perpendicular line? You just flip. Right? So. But I think what you're talking about shouldn't be too much of an issue on this assignment. Like, I'll go ahead and tell you. So there's a problem. It's problem 3-3 three, three in the textbook. What it is is there is a bracket that is used to, um, it's like a crowbar that pulls a nail out of a piece of wood. And so the idea is you need, I think it's 200 pounds of force to yank the nail out of the wood. So how much force do you need to apply to the crowbar? And so the idea is if you know the moment to yank the nail out, how much force do you need to apply to generate that same moment? So. Any questions? Okay, um, we're actually probably going to end it a little bit early today uh, because I don't really have a lot else to talk about. What I can tell you is we, that starting on um, lecture on Wednesday, we are going to start to employ the dot product. And so we're going to use the dot product 
for a very specific example. I kind of want to explain this so that, so that everybody kind of understands. Ultimately, what we're doing in two dimensions, if you would agree, ultimately what we're doing in two dimensions is taking moments about the z-axis. That's really what we're doing because if we're talking about a point here and a force here and they're spinning like this, here's the z-axis. They're spinning either about this axis or, or about this way. It's all about just about the direction. So what we're doing here is determining the moments about the z-axis. What about determining the moments about an arbitrary axis? So in order to do that, we use the dot product. Okay, And so the dot product, unlike the cross product, is really easy to do. Um, and so basically what we do for moments about an arbitrary axis is we take R cross F and we just dot it with the unit vector for the axis in question. And so not it sounds wild. It's actually pretty easy to do. So um, we'll talk about that on Wednesday. But that's all I got, everybody. You get out early. Eight minutes early.